Well, good morning. How are you all doing? Excellent. Okay, great. Welcome to worship, whether you're here in person or you are joining us online. We are glad you are here. I'm Reverend Nicole Riley, lead and teaching pastor. And as always, if you want to follow along with the notes for the sermon, you will find those on our church app. Today is Music Appreciation Sunday, and it's also the start of our new series called Joy. We're looking at joy in our lives through joy in worship, joy in community, and then our last Sunday we're going to be talking about uh, joy in the Spirit. That is going to be Pentecost, which is the birthday of our church and the day you need to wear red, right? We remember that part. Um, We will be having a great three weeks. This is going to be a very uplifting sermon series and a really good opportunity for you just to kind of breathe it in and feel God's power and presence and all these gifts that God has given us. So as as we begin, what I want to do is I want you to go back into your memory a bit. I want you to think about What worship service comes to your mind that was powerful or important to you? Now, it it may have been a a baptism. Maybe a beloved child was being baptized. Maybe it was a Christmas Eve worship or Easter Sunday. Maybe the worship service that touched you was a regular Sunday, but there was some piece of music or a word that was said that really helped you and really made a difference for you. Or maybe what you remember about that worship service was where you were. Maybe it was the worship service when we first came back into the building after COVID, or or maybe it was a worship service when you were in Europe, in a great cathedral, or someplace that you traveled, a different space to worship. I'm going to guess for a lot of us, though, what we remember is maybe not all the pieces of the worship, but what we really focus on is we remember who sat next to us, maybe a beloved person in our lives who's no longer with us. Worship matters. And we all have these memories if we've been someone who's been part of a worshiping congregation. So I want you to remember that service and the joy that even now, remembering back on it. Uh, The one I think about is uh, when uh, Jeff and Jacob and I were at Hope in Torrance, One Christmas Eve, we broke the usual tradition. The usual tradition was uh, we had a very lovely organist and pianist who played for us, and this year he was out of town, and so the worship band did all the music. And I wasn't sure how that was going to go. The older folks in the church who had our usual tradition of attending worship, I wasn't sure if all this new music from a worship band was going to be something, but I remember looking out, and seeing the kind of matriarch and patriarch of the church, Clint and Janice, with their hands in the air during one of the songs. So enraptured were they by the worship that Christmas Eve. We all have those memories, those memories that make us think about worship and how it has grounded us and given us strength and life. So today we're going to talk about the joy of worship. And we're going to look at how we can not only um, grow our appreciation of worship, but also get more out of worship. You know, how we can grow in what we experience on Sundays when we gather or when we gather online throughout the week. So our text today is going to help us do this. Our text is from Psalm 84, and I want to tell you a little bit about this psalm. We're going to actually look at it in three pieces, because I think there's a lot of it, and we'll look at each piece and what it's talking about with us today. But I want to start with the background. So Psalm 84 is a psalm about worship. It's a beautiful psalm. It's one of those psalms, I think, if you just read it once a week, it would just open up your life because of what it talks about. 
It speaks of the desire that we have in us to worship. And in this psalm, that desire is put in the mouths of those who are on a journey. They're on a journey to attend worship. And in this case, it would have been on a journey to attend worship in Jerusalem at the temple. Today, when we hear this psalm, we think of it more in light of our own experience of worship and how worship calls us to. So let me start with the first four verses of Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. So the psalm starts out with this feeling of longing to worship God, to be in God's presence. And we hear it by a variety of words. I mean, we use that word longing there in the psalm, but also it talks about fainting. We don't hear that a lot in the, in the scripture, fainting. And just the, also the words that jump out were happiness and a heart and a flesh that sing for joy. It paints this picture for us this morning of, of the pull of worship. And, and not only the pull of worship for people, but Animals. Did you notice the birds that are mentioned in this first part? The sparrow and the swallow are able to be in the house of the Lord and to sing God's praises. They come in this psalm with an expectation, an expectation that they will meet God in worship. And I hope that we all come with that expectation, that openness, that willingness to meet God. A couple weeks ago, Jeff and I had dinner with good friends of ours, and I asked if they were attending worship now, and they said um, that they went online and watched the sermon, but that they weren't going anymore because they really weren't connecting in worship. And as they talked about it, I just felt so sad Because that happens a lot. But here's the thing. You and I, we are created to worship God. To connect not only with God, but to connect with God's messy people. (laughs) You know, like a friend of mine who says, I love worship. It's the people that are the problem for me. Now, I know life gets so busy, and I know that in today's world, it's really hard to find the space in our lives for worship. But I want to encourage you as we talk today to think about how you can grow in your worship and grow into having this same joy and this same longing that we hear about in today's psalm. For we are called to find the joy in worship. And here's some steps that you and I can take to grow and deepen our understanding of worship. I created this little chart for us to look at. And the first is on how to get the most out of worship is attend weekly. Now, as I say this, I'm very aware of the fact that a lot of us cannot attend worship weekly. And the reality of that is 30% of all adult Americans work on Sunday. So, some of us can come on Sundays. Some of us can watch online during the week. But it's important to develop a regular kind of habit with that. And I say that because we know that in all areas of our life, right? If you follow the diet just one day out of seven, if you go to the gym once a month, right? It's really needing to build that muscle of attending and being part regularly. 
Now, I know that doesn't work for everyone, so think about what it works for you and how you might take a step more toward that. Because regular worship is about grounding us, and it will ground us in our life and our faith really like nothing else will. Second, remember worship pleases God. God desires to meet us, and we have set it up so that God meets us here together on Sunday morning. God desires to connect with us. God wants us to connect with each other. It pleases him when we do this. God calls us to worship him, not because God needs us to worship him, but because we need to worship God. It puts everything in perspective in our lives when we do that. Number three, expect to hear from God. We've already touched on this a little bit, but I just want to say to you that you should have an expectation when you come to worship that you hear something from God. Now, it might be a song that touches you. It might be a scripture that means something to you. It might be a moment in the sermon that you write down and take home with you. It might be a person, someone that says hi to you, someone that you connect to and say hi. Expect when you walk through that door or when you watch online that you will hear from God a word for your life. And so some of what that means is putting down all the distractions. I think the hardest thing for me when we were watching worship online was to not also be doing other things, right? That, that's a tough one. But we get more when we give our attention. The next one's a hard one. Sleep well and arrive early. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't sleep much on Saturday night. And for me, that's because... Every Sunday is like Christmas Day, right? So I'm up throughout the night. I mean, Jeff and I don't even sleep in the same bed on Saturday night because it only should be me who gets no sleep, right? I'm excited every Saturday night and excited to bring to you something on Sunday morning. But to the best of your ability, <laughs> sleep well and arrive early. I mean, I had a family when I was growing up, we were always late for church. We always just skated in during the opening song. And none of us were ever in a good mood. There was usually yelling in the car to get us in the car. I'm the oldest of four. And then to get us in church, right? That, of course, made it harder to connect. So do what you can to get a little sleep and to arrive early so you can connect to people. Number five, prepare your hearts. You know, the way I do this is just take a moment as we're starting to take a deep breath. Just be present. Put aside all those things I'm thinking about that can wait. And prepare myself to be open to what God would do in this time. Some of what you might do, I'm going to keep harping on the sermon notes. Pull up the sermon notes or say a prayer. Or just take that deep breath, look around, see who's here, and be ready for what God has. Next, pray for those who are leading. You know, all of us who come and we lead on Sunday morning in all kinds of different ways, we come with our own busy lives, right? Our own worries and fears, just like everyone else. And your prayers are what enable us to focus. I mean, we prepare and we're ready, but your prayers for us enable us to give our best on Sundays. Number seven, take notes. Okay, one of the hardest things I will say about being a preacher is they tell you that people only remember five to 10% of what you say on a Sunday morning. I only wish I knew which 5 or 10% it was. <laughs> then I could just focus there. The sermons could be a lot shorter. I could just say, here's your five minutes. So I invite you to take notes because one of the things that taking notes does is it helps you remember. Um, that's why we include uh, the sermon notes so that the whole outline is there. So if you don't take notes, you can at least go back and look at that. 
Um, I notice on Sunday mornings, a lot of times people will take pictures of the slides as a way to remember, and I think that's super great too. So however you take notes as a way to take an idea that then you want to take into your week. Eight, discuss the message with somebody. You know, it helps a lot if you take what you're thinking about for your own faith and share that. Now, it doesn't need to be some deep, in-depth thing, but just where you're at, what you're thinking. You may share it with someone that you come to worship with. You may share it if you're online with people you worship with online. You may journal about it, you know, reflect on it that way, or, or post about it on social media, just sharing with someone some of what you're learning, what God is doing in your life. And also we know that that 5 to 10% that you remember of the sermon, if you take that and really focus on it, it enables it to become deeper and richer in your life. Number nine, encourage someone. Find someone who you don't know on Sunday morning and look for the opportunity to encourage them. I think most all of us are here because we want to be encouraged. Um, I will always remember when I was at Hope in Torrance, we did this thing called the Crop Walk, and we were out walking around on one Saturday for the Crop Walk, raising money, and we went by this one church, beautiful little church. The title of the sermon was on the marquee, and the title was Eternal Damnation. I thought, who is getting up early for that? Right? Right? We are here to encourage one another. And you would be surprised at how little it takes. A smile from someone, a we're glad to see you, or I haven't met you yet, what is your name, here's my name. We need to encourage one another. Don't leave here today without encouraging somebody. And number 10, serve. One of the things you may not know about Sunday morning is most everyone you see, except for a small handful of us, are volunteers. Yes, we have staff. We have a core staff who makes all the things happen. But we really run on the strength of our unpaid servants, those who do all the things, you know, our choir, our band, our ushers, our greeters, all these people who give of themselves. You know, I don't know what the ratio is, but I think, you know, if you looked at it, I think it's at least five volunteers for one staff. And then one, I was counting one week, and I was like, there were 20 volunteers that week for one staff, depending on all that's going on. So who are these unsung heroes? Well, they are ushers and greeters, those who are at the welcome table and welcome newcomers, the person who makes the announcements, those who set up for communion, those who make our beautiful flower arrangements and do our decorations, those who run the lights, the choir and the band, Sunday school teachers, youth for youth and for children and for our adults, those who set up and clean up our, I was going to say happy hour, fellowship time. (laughs) And those who pick up the donuts. (laughs) Now, sometimes people will say, like, I don't feel very connected. I'm not really connected at the church. And I always say, have you started serving? You know, just something simple, something that you can do. Um, A lot of our services, there's no prep for it. You just show up, you get to connect to people, you get to have some fun, you get to make some new friends. So as you were coming in today, they gave you a little card that says joy on it, and it has a place for you to mark and to put your name and your email about something you'd like to know about. I think a church that has a high number of people involved in service is a strong church, and a church that is run by the staff or the pastors, is a weak church. Sometimes when there's a transition and pastors move on, volunteers will say, we'll just wait and see. Don't be those people, because I'll come back and get you, okay? (laughs) 
Be the people who step up and who are excited to serve and to give. I want for you on Sunday morning, for you to feel like those who wrote this psalm. Let's read this first part together. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altar. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. So that's the first part of today's psalm. Let me read you the second section. It says this, Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. So this second section is all about the happiness and the health of those who worship, how it transforms them and what it does for them. But as I was working on this this week, I could not help but think about the tragedy that happened this last Sunday at the Taiwanese church in Laguna Woods and how a gunman came into that church, well, into the fellowship time, and killed one man and injured five more. It is hard to talk about that God is our strength and our help in the midst of those times, but it is yet what we are called to do. It is heartbreaking that we live in a time where this happens. But I want to share with you what we do know about what the worship of God does for us for our physical health, and also for our mental and emotional health. So the information I do want to share with you comes from the Harvard School of Public Health. And it says this, Regular worship is linked to reduction in the stress response and to early mortality. Now what this means is this is a study that was done, it was a long-term study, and it was done with uh, medical professionals, a lot of nurses in fact. And over an 18-year period, they tracked the nurses and they found out that their stress decreased and that they lived a longer life than others. Second, it said that people, attend, people who attend religious services weekly were significantly less likely to die from deaths of despair. Now, what are those? Those are deaths that include suicide, drug overdoses, and alcohol poisoning. One of the authors of the study wrote this. He said, Despair is something that can confront anyone dealing with severe difficulties or loss. While the term, deaths of despair, was originally coined in the context of working-class Americans struggling with unemployment, it is a phenomenon that is relevant more broadly, such as to the healthcare professionals in our study who may be struggling with excessive demands and burnout, or to anyone facing loss. As such, we need to look for important community resources that can protect against it. Worship is one of those places where we are reminded of the hope that is beyond us, where we are reminded that as bad as life can be at times, that it is not the end of our story, that we have a God who loves us and meets us. 
In looking at statistics around children and youth, it said this, that kids and youth who regularly attended religious services were 18% more likely to report higher happiness as they became young adults and were 29% more likely to volunteer. Now, why is this? Why, when we look at these statistics, do we see that participation in worship has such a positive effect on people? on their physical health as well as their mental and emotional health. Well, I think it's something very simple but extremely important, and that is that when we worship, we draw strength from God. When we worship, we hear of a God who loves us and wants us to live the life that he came to give us in Jesus. We hear that we are designed to lean into his strength so that we might live our lives. Let's read this piece of the psalm together. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion, as they go through the valley of Baca. They make it a place of springs, the early rain that covers it with pools, They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. This piece of the text is basically saying that our strength comes from God and that our hearts are on this path to God. And even when we go through valleys that are dry, which is the valley of Baca, It turns into uh, lush pastures where we find God's hope and that we are a people who can go from strength to strength. I think the statistics are really interesting and helpful when we think about how we are called to live and that worship has so many benefits for us, but they are rooted in one thing, and that is our connection to a God who loves us deeply and who claims us and who gives us strength. My friends, life is often hard. There are lots of tragedies and difficulties that we will experience. But the God we meet in worship gives us strength. Let's look at the last section. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love this image that the one who worships declares that it is better to be a gatekeeper, which for us we translate it as janitor. It's better to be a janitor in the house of the Lord than to have the, live in the tents of the wicked, which is those who have all the things, those who have all the resources, but do not have God. So it's better to be somebody who just shows up and gives to God rather than those who are just enjoying their own wealth and prosperity. This is a statement of devotion. It's a statement of love. It's a statement from someone who had experienced that worship indeed had changed his life. Not just in that hour, but in the days between the Sundays. And we all know that. We know that when we become a people who worship, we are a people who's how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we spend our talents, how we spend our energy changes. And we too may find that we enjoy just hanging out at church, picking up the papers on the floor our own janitor way. I guess now we don't have papers. What do we pick up now? Those communion cups when we have Sunday, yeah. We are called to serve. We're called to be those gatekeepers in the house of God. This is because of who God is. The text says that God is a shield 
which means that God is our protector and that God is our son, S-U-N. God is the source of our lives. And he blesses and he withholds nothing from his people. And those who trust in him find true happiness. Read this part with me. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Worship shapes us. Worship transforms us. Worship connects us to God and one another. Worship is a lifestyle. Today, after service, we are celebrating one of our own. We are celebrating Sherry Claus. Sherry's been on our staff since 1994. And if you love worship here, it is because of Sherry. <laughs> the thing about Sherry is she has the total attention to detail. She has creativity and drive and love and faith, and all of that has made a tremendous difference. I think it has made the difference for this church. There is no one like her, and we have been blessed by her. Today, I want you to think about how you can take your next steps in worship so that the joy of worship enters your life more fully. On our chart, you'll see the 10 ways, and I want you to pick one that you might work on, maybe from now till the fall. Take some next steps so that you would grow and that worship would become more who you are. Not because you have to do it, no one's going to be checking, but because you want to do it and because you know it will change your life for there is no other joy like the joy of worship. Let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> 